When it comes to cruising destinations in the Pacific Northwest, Prince William Sound must surely be the jewel in the crown. For boats too large to trailer, reaching this gem means forsaking the protection of the inside passage for the treacherous waters of the Gulf of Alaska. During the summer of 2013, Motor Yacht Venture, a Fleming 65, made the journey from Vancouver Island to Prince William Sound. Once in the Gulf of Alaska, we visited beautiful but treacherous Lutuya Bay. Shaped like a fish with its mouth open to the turbulent waters of the Gulf of Alaska, this alluring inlet has a violent and tumultuous past. Late on the evening of July the 10th, 1958, three small boats lay serenely at anchor in the calm waters of the bay. Aboard the Adri, Howard and his seven-year-old son were just settling in for the night. There was a large rumbling noise from up at the head of the bay with a slight pause. I thought that everything was over with. Yet some movement up there caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. A oh, huge wave. It looked like just a big wall of water. To me, a life preserver, and he's, he said, son, stop praying. You're looking at death, and this is exactly my first thought. I had 40 fathoms of anchor chain, and it started running out off the boat. Came to the end of the 40 fathoms, just snapped like a string. We were swept up over the land and up above the trees. That's where I assumed that we were going to end up. Amazingly, their boat was washed back into the bay, but others were not so lucky. One was carried stern first over La Chaussée Spit and dropped into the ocean. The remaining vessel was swept under and sunk without trace while running for the entrance. Back in 1953, scientists visiting Latuya Bay had wondered why mature forests did not extend down to the shoreline where their place had been taken by bands of younger trees. They surmised it must have been due to a tsunami of some sort. But what could be the source of such an immense wave? Now, five years later, here was the answer. An 8.3 magnitude earthquake had broken loose 90 million tons of rock, creating a gravity wave which had reached the astounding record height of 1,720 feet, put into stark perspective by this illustration. A companion wave, 100 feet high, then raced the length of the bay at 130 miles an hour, stripping the shoreline to bare rock and leaving the bay awash with blocks of ice and the remains of thousands of trees. In the wake of this upheaval, scientists using tree rings and other evidence concluded that in past years there had been at least five similar events with an average interval between them of 26 years. As we prepared to visit Latuya Bay we were very aware that 55 years had passed since the catastrophic events of 1958. Cape Spencer Light marks the separation of the inland waters from the stormy seas of the Gulf of Alaska. The weather gods smiled on us and the ocean was calm. Immense snow-capped peaks lining the coast for hundreds of miles were revealed in all their glory. The entrance to Latuya Bay runs north-south and it is not easy to spot from seaward. The most prominent landmarks being a pair of conical hills named the Paps. Range markers show the correct course through the channel but the rear beacon was hidden in the trees and revealed itself only after we were convinced that it must be missing. During recorded history, this bar has been responsible for the loss of more than 100 lives and demands respect. But today the gulf was calm, our timing right, and transit through the entrance presented no problem. Once inside, we headed towards Cenotaph Island. A cliff on its southern end was home to a colony of black-legged kittiwakes who wheeled around our heads against the backdrop of the immense mountains.
he dropped anchor, launched the tender, and toured the upper bay. The Fairweather Fault runs along the base of the mountains, and Cascade Glacier, like its two companions, is not glistening white, but covered in dirt. The scar from the huge rock fall which generated the wave is still clear to see, as is the trim line marking its height. Photos taken in 1958 line up exactly with those taken today. Mount Quincy Adams at 13,650 feet and Mount Crillon at 12,700 dominate the skyline. For us the beauty and peace of Latuya Bay was stunning and we celebrated our arrival with a dram of Jura single malt whiskey. But lurking in the back of our minds was the thought that it was an evening such as this that preceded the events of 1958. It was hard to imagine that this place of serene beauty had been the same where hell had broken loose, not once, but many times. A place where winter's ferocious catabatic winds came screaming down from these same peaks at over 100 miles an hour, beating the water into a frenzy and carrying it over the top of Cenotaph Island. Tendrils of mist floated across the calm but moving water, adding a touch of drama to the stillness of the evening. The following morning dawned calm. We took the tender past Cenotaph Island to the beach inland from La Chaussee Spit. Once ashore and the tender secured, we walked along the beach towards the entrance. We saw no bears but recent tracks in the sand were evidence that they were not far away. Wild lupins were in abundance, and the shoreline was still littered with the remains of trees which had been uprooted by the 1958 wave. Walking was difficult over loose stones, with every step an invitation for a twisted ankle. Chris was worried that a curious bear might slash the tender, leaving us stranded on the beach so we abandoned our walk and instead used the tender to approach the bar, ever mindful of its dangers. In July 1786, two French sailing ships, the Astrolabe and the Boussole, arrived off La Touille under the command of Admiral La Perouse. Two boats were launched to reconnoitre the channel, but as the ships approached the bar, the wind hauled ahead and their sails were taken aback. It must have been a flood tide because the two vessels were then carried into the bay on the current. La Perouse later commented that during his 30 years experience he had never seen two ships so near destruction. A few days later three boats were dispatched to survey the entrance with strict instructions to keep clear until the tide was slack. Ignoring these orders, first one boat and then a second were sucked inexorably into the maw of the channel. Two boats and 21 men were overwhelmed and never seen again. La Perouse left a memorial to the lost men on the island which he named Cenotaph, meaning empty tomb. This memorial disappeared and was later replaced. In 1985 a bronze plaque was installed by the Lutuya Bay Historical Society, but by 2004 
this too had been vandalized and stolen. La Perouse stayed 21 days in the bay and went on to sail to Macau and Siberia before heading for present-day Sydney. From there he went north, where both ships were lost in the typhoon in the New Hebrides. The following morning, the day of our departure, we awoke to find ourselves shrouded in fog. The time of our leaving was determined by the tide. If we waited, it would have to be until the next high water slack in 12 hours. We cautiously felt our way down the bay, past the kitty wakes. We decided that if visibility improved to enable us to see both sides of the entrance, it would be safe to proceed. The range markers were invisible that we could follow our inbound course on the plotter. The seas were calm, but the water swirled with strong currents. Once clear of the boulders and cormorant rock, Chris swung venture through a wide arc and pointed our bows north, leaving in our wake memories of a truly remarkable place. Our next port of call is Yucatan, from where we navigate the stunning waters leading to the Hubbard Glacier. We called next at Dramatic Kayak Island. This is the site of the first landing in 1748 by the Russian expedition under the command of Bering. By a strange coincidence, 37 years later, Captain Cook also chanced to choose Kayak Island as his first landing on what is now called Alaska. From here we made a direct crossing of the Gulf to Hinchinbrook entrance into Prince William Sound. We followed a fishing boat into Cordova Harbour, overlooked by a memorial to mariners lost at sea. Many slips were vacant as most boats were taking advantage of one of the carefully controlled fish openings. The season was in full swing for the famous Copper River salmon, whose deep red and tasty flesh 
was attributed to the harder fight for the fish to swim up the powerful river. Cordova has many canneries which together process over 30 million pounds of fish each year. The town is also famous for the vast numbers of migrating birds that use the Copper River Delta as a stopover each spring. These are mostly western sandpipers whose main mating area is the Yukon. These tiny birds have flown about 200 miles per day to reach here from San Francisco or in some cases even as far away as South America. We could not resist taking a closer look at Bly Reef upon which the Exxon Valdez had come to grief in 1979 even to the extent of following her exact course. The red lines show our track over the reef. With our five foot draft, compared to 65 feet for the doomed tanker, we were in no danger of suffering the same fate. The departing ship had been diverted into the inbound shipping channel due to ice flowing from the Columbia Glacier. This is what the reef looks like on a depth sounder. The glacier has retreated a further 12 miles and lost half its thickness since 1980. We anchored for the night in Heather Bay, where huge blocks of ice were aground on the rocky shore. In a cold rain we launched both tenders and toured the flows, even to the point of touching them. With the benefit of hindsight, this was extremely foolhardy, as we learnt when, without warning, one of the flows blew apart with a detonation like a field gun and disintegrated right alongside us. A group of hardy kayakers prepared to take to the frigid waters. The radar shows the extent of the ice in Columbia Bay as the glacier continues its rapid retreat. Keep in mind that only one-eighth of the total mass of the ice is visible, and the seven-eighths beneath the water melts faster than the top, causing the flows to become very unstable. During a second visit to Columbia Bay, we had much better luck with the weather. We cruise among a flotilla of ice flows, carving at a prodigious rate from the face of the receding glacier. The Columbia began its catastrophic retreat during the 1970s, regressing more than 10 miles in 25 years. In March 1989, Ice from here obstructed the outgoing channel from the oil terminal in Valdez, triggering the Exxon Valdez disaster. Ice flows provide haulouts for seals and this bevy of sea otters. We keep our distance.
From here we pass through Valdez Narrows to the town of Valdez. The AIS showed many fishing boats at anchor, awaiting the announcement for the next opening. The harbour was jam-packed and we had to wait to be allocated a berth. This fishing boat was registered in Astoria, Oregon, and we had been tied up next to her in Cordova. All local harbours provide a filleting service with the remainder of the fish being discarded to the delight of the resident gulls. Venture looked quite out of place among the fleet of commercial boats. As soon as we left the harbour, we were immersed in thick fog. From here we crossed to the town of Cordova, which we have visited twice before. We are invited to join Robert aboard his bow picker. These boats can be trailered. We head through shifting shallows to the fishing grounds, open on this occasion for 36 hours. At the appointed time, and not one second before, nets are deployed over the bow. After one hour spent deterring seals who think this exercise is solely for their benefit, the net is hauled in and the salmon disentangled. Normally a one-person operation, Robert is assisted on this occasion by venture crew member David, who is trying his hand at this for the first time. catches iced and later 
in exchange for a receipt in the form of a fish ticket, is delivered to larger boats called tenders, representing the processing company. After a few hours, we rendezvous with a float plane, which taxis up to the boat, allowing us to step onto the floats. From the air, we are able to grasp the full extent of the vast Copper River Delta, with its maze of channels. A road extends out to Million Dollar Bridge, built in the early 1900s to service the Kennecott copper mine. One span collapsed in the 1964 Alaska earthquake. Repaired at great expense in 2005, it was again put beyond the reach of road traffic when, in 2011, a second bridge was swept away at mile 36. The glaciers and rugged terrain are breathtaking. This would be a bad place for a float plane to lose an engine. We land safely on Ayak Lake, just outside Cordova. Dawn heralds the start of a new day in the Naked Islands. Using the power davit, Chris and Kaylin soon have the large tender in the water. Venture carries two tenders, including the small one, which can be dragged up the beach. Here in Hobo Bay, we go ashore to hike to the site of an abandoned gold mine. Walking is surprisingly hard. Gentle meadows are not what they seem, and ponds and swamps abound. Steve loses his soul. In fact, he loses them both as they are sucked from his boots by the boggy muskeg. Hidden among the tangled vegetation are wildflowers, like this aptly named Shooting Star. Unable to locate the mine and plagued by insects, bushwhacking back the way we have come lacks appeal. We are relieved to be able to reach Chris aboard Venture to pick us up in the big tender from this beach. We find this cave with the tide at just the right height to allow us to enter. We are just south of the epicenter of the 1964 earthquake which devastated all three towns and one native village within the Sound. Some parts of the Sound were uplifted as much as 35 feet, while other areas sank, allowing seawater to encroach on the land, creating what are known as ghost forests. We head south to Blackstone.
flocks of kittiwakes nest in every crevice. Powerful falls are fed by meltwater from a hanging glacier nicknamed Death Trap. Out of sight from the base of the cliffs, ice carved from its face can fall without warning on anyone unlucky enough to be below. Without a point of reference, it is impossible to judge the scale of our surroundings. It is not until we take the tender close to the icy face that we appreciate its immense height. This is a photographer's paradise, especially under the wonderful weather it has been our good fortune to enjoy. The approach to the town of Whittier is a long scenic passage canal. Built as a military outpost during World War II, 75% of residents live in this one apartment block. The town sits in the shadow of Whittier Glacier and receives more than 200 inches of snow per year. The two marinas have waiting lists of up to 14 years, so we need to tie up alongside charter boat Discovery. Here we take on our first fuel since leaving Juneau. The town began life as a military outpost in World War II. A rail spur tunnel through the mountain was built in 1943. But it was not until 2000 that a road, sharing the same tunnel as the railway, made it possible to drive the 60 miles to Anchorage. The following morning we crossed the fjord to make a brief stop at a waterfall surrounded by thousands of wheeling kittiwakes. We make our way to Harvard Glacier at the head of College Fjord. We are surprised to see Discovery, our birth mate in Whittier. She is well into the ice and close to the action.
discovery moves on. As does venture. Trip in the tender gives a sense of scale to this immense wall of ice and makes us feel very insignificant. Many of the ice flows carry debris from the glaciers and Steve works enthusiastically saving souvenirs from a watery grave. <laughs> this super sized sample now resides in Southern California as a memento of native rock gouged from the mountains centuries ago by the raw force of nature. From her vantage point on the anchor platform, Christine watches Venture's bow nudge aside rafts of floating ice. At Whittier, we had been invited by Duke to visit Eshamie Lodge, about 35 miles south and accessible only by boat or float plane. We tie up at the dock and are given a tour of the neat lodge, nestled among the trees. Duke checks his gill nets and returns with a boatload of freshly caught salmon. He generously presents us with a pair of salmon fillets, which Pamela kindly cooks for us. Soon after our departure the following day, a pod of dull porpoise, resembling miniature orcas, streak back and forth across Venture's bow. We move to Barnes Cove off Dryer Bay on Night Island. Here in our favorite spot, we rendezvous with a local boat out of Whittier, whom we had met during our previous visit in 2015. Along the shores of this beautiful anchorage, we see three different black bears browsing along the shoreline. 
The following morning we prepare for further exploration. This includes a climb up to a knoll overlooking the tranquil bay. Wildflowers include this sundew, which is a beautiful but deadly trap for insects. Venture resembles a toy boat floating on a surface of polished glass. The water is as clear as crystal. Using the tender and the kayaks, we explore adjacent bays and inlets. Pillow lava forms when liquid rock flows into the water, as seen today in parts of Hawaii. As we pass down Night Island Passage, we hear a caller on the radio reporting the largest pod of orcas he has seen for 10 years. He is at Point Helen, which by amazing good fortune lies just ahead of us. Within 15 minutes we find ourselves surrounded by hundreds of orcas and humpback whales. We barely move through the water and they pay us little attention. Sounds of their heavy breathing fills the air. We go next to Needle Rock, which is a favoured haul-out for stellar sea lions. Further south, we see numerous humpback whales feeding close inshore. We pass numerous seals on our approach to Chenega, the last of the tidewater glaciers we visit during our month in Prince William Sound. We hope the amount of ice is proof of frequent carving from the heavily fissured glacier face. We nudge our way through extensive ice to reach its crumbling face.
we collect a piece of glacial ice that glitters like diamond. The retreating glacier reveals shoreline rocks over which meltwater cascades. The fractured ice cracks and booms from immense internal pressures until it reaches journey's end and tumbles into the sea. It must have been a truly spectacular carving which created this beautiful ice sculpture. What we see here is only one-eighth of the total, with the remainder being hidden beneath the water. Along this southern coast is some of the most dramatic scenery we have encountered on the entire trip. We entered Barry Arm where three tidewater glaciers would once have come together and filled the bay with ice. The original termination point of receding glaciers is marked by a moraine of debris where water depths are drastically reduced, as shown on this chart and the depth sounder. The most easterly of the three is Cox, which flows in waves down to the water. The centre glacier is Barry, where a tour boat has brought kayakers to paddle amongst the ice flows. The third glacier has receded from the water, revealing rocks which clearly demonstrate that they too were once beneath the ice. This glacier is named Cascade, after the nearby spectacular waterfall. The Prize Glacier lies just around the corner. Waterfalls tumble down, fed by meltwater from hanging glaciers far above our heads. Surprise has the reputation of being the most active glacier in the sound, but we have to wait four hours with camera constantly at the ready before our patience is rewarded.
Cascade has the largest waterfall by volume in the Sound. Returning east across the Sound, we explore hidden inlets through narrow entrances. The range is great and extensive areas are exposed when the tide is out. Narrow inlets must be navigated at slack tide. We explore shallow waters where shoals of salmon congregate at the mouths of small streams and rivers in a shimmering mix of fresh and salt water. Every boulder carries a wig of trees sprouting from what appears to be solid rock. The one on the right provides a perch for an adult bald eagle. Now in her twelfth season, Venture carries two tenders, plus a pair of kayaks.
We are now back in the vicinity of the Columbia Glacier, where chunks of errant ice drift on the tide past verdant forest. Wild salmon congregate in vast numbers as they wait to enter the streams where they started life. Less snow in the mountains means that flow from streams has been reduced to critical levels by the time the salmon arrive to spawn. Venture's chart plotter records our rambling course during the month we spent exploring the wonders of Prince William Sound. We pay another brief visit to Cordova and head for the Gulf of Alaska, pausing only to take photos of Venture with the backdrop of dramatic Cape St. Elias at the tip of Kayak Island. 